I'd like to thank Ray and Sophie, and especially Sophie, for inviting me to give this talk um, even before I started working here, <laughs> which was less than two months ago. So um, when we think about uveitis, it's important to know that a group of uveitis specialists back in 1978 got together and formed the uh, International Uveitis Study Group and agreed that there would be some ways that we would um, describe uveitis and classify it both anatomically with, of course, anterior, intermediate, posterior, and pan, depending on where the inflammation is present. And also, you, um, you can classify it clinically as either infectious or non-infectious um, or as a masquerade. Um, the standard, standardization of uveitis nomenclature um, gives us a grading system for anterior inflammation, the cells, based on the number of cells per high-powered field, and the flare, based on how well um, generally you can see the iris and whether or not there's fibrin. Um, and it's important to know that if you're going to call it trace, or 0.5 plus cells, there must be at least one cell per high-powered field, so looking in four quadrants. So just seeing one cell total flipping around in there doesn't make it trace cell. Um, there is no uh, consensus about how to grade vitreous cell, and so the, um, some people use the National Eye Institute um, grading system, and that's where I train, so that's sort of what I use. Um, and this, it becomes quite difficult to count cells in the vitreous, and so many people do a little bit more of a gestalt, I think, when they grade vitreous cell. Um, there is agreement about how to grade vitreous haze, and this is a grading system using a 20 diopter lens looking into the back of the eye um, at the optic nerve, and it's based on, in part, how well you can see the optic nerve in the vessels. So this would be um, just about a three plus I based on this photograph. So when we are developing a differential diagnosis, of course we wanna know is it acute or chronic? Where is the inflammation? Um, some people feel granulomatous is important, but um, it can start out granulomatous and become non-granulomatous and vice versa. Um, of course we wanna know other things about the patient um, and whether or not there are any signs on physical exam. So here's a 52-year-old man. He was referred to us after he presented with um, acute blurred vision and light sensitivity in his left eye. Um, he was found to have anterior uveitis, non-granulomatous, worse in the eye that I'm not showing you. And he also had vitreous cell and haze. In this right eye, you can see that he has um, an area of retinitis and a, an occlusion of an artery. In his left eye, um, he had quite a lot of haze and inflammation and the optic nerve was barely visible. And the peripheral retinal exam was very difficult, although there was a hint of maybe some retinitis and the referring doctor was concerned about um, a viral um, etiology. But he also had this rash on his hands. He had another rash, he had some rash on his feet. Um, and we knew he was HIV positive, he had not been taking heart therapy and he was positive for RPR and syphilis IgG. So um, this is syphilis-related panuveitis, and um, we saw an another nice case of syphilis-related uveitis last night. Um, he was treated with IV penicillin, and so this is um, a reminder to me to look at people's <laughs> hands before I shake them, and um, maybe... <laughs> <laughs> yes, I don't actually shake hands very often with my patients, um, and uh, perhaps even looking at their feet and in their mouths, etc. Um, and this, these things don't cost us anything except for time, which of course can be very dear if you're a retina specialist trying to see 60 patients or more, um, so you might be sending them to me so I can look in their mouths. Um, so of course, um, of course we know that uh, there's lots of labs and there's sort of that quote unquote uveitis workup that you'll see written in a note and the question is always, what exactly did they do for the uveitis workup? So when I see a patient, I do a bit of combing through to figure out which labs were done when. Um, and you could, you could order everything under the sun and um, get a lot of confusing results. So it's usually better to try to be somewhat targeted and keep in mind the patient's pocketbook because um, it can cost a lot of money. But um, despite the million dollar workup, at least million dollars, um, at least 40% of cases could still be idiopathic. Um, but we should never fall on that diagnosis easily. So we have to still do a lot of work before we are willing to accept that. So here's another patient, a 61-year-old woman. She had decreased vision for two weeks. She had a lot of pain behind the eye, light sensitivity, redness. She was also a diabetic. She was referred for retinal vasculitis. Um, her vision in this eye was 20-80. She had an APD. 
Um, she had anterior cell and vitreous cell and some haze. You can see there's um, obviously some retinal hemorrhage and vasculitis. There's also a lot of retinal whitening out here in the nasal aspect. Um, her other eye just reflects some diabetic retinopathy. And um, so we did do a PCR on her aqueous um, from an AC tap, which was positive for varicella zoster virus. So PCR and uveitis, and we heard a lot about that last night. I think a lot of people are using it now, and um, that's um, really great uh, for all of us. As we know, it just detects the presence of DNA or RNA, not necessarily active infection. Um, many of the studies have um, compared, tried to figure out what we could consider the gold standard for diagnosing something um, infectious, and you could look at the Goldman-Whitmer looking at the antibodies in the eye versus the